years ago when North Point Ministries entered foster care and decided we needed to find our place in foster care, we quickly discovered several things, three that I want to tell you. Number one, foster care is hard. Most of you already know that. Number two, foster care is a ministry of the unexpected. There are constantly unexpected things that happen in foster care, some of them great things and some of them not so great things. And the third thing is foster care is messy. Most of you know foster care is messy. Anytime a child has need of foster care, it's because they've come from some sort of mess. We have a saying in our churches, we walk toward the messes. And we walk toward the messes because what we've discovered is the messes, the context of the messes is where real ministry generally happens. So we walk toward the messes in foster care. And when we began developing our ministry and figuring out how to do foster care within the context of the mess, we decided we want to do two things really well. We want to care for foster children and their birth families really well. And we want to hit the ball out of the park in caring for the families that choose to partner with us and become foster families. So those were two things that we wanted to do, and we knew we were gonna to need to come up with a model that would help us do that. We are standing on the shoulders of some amazing ministries in our area who helped us with that in the beginning. We were able to take a lot of what other ministries taught us and kind of customize that a little bit to, um, to make it fit with our ministry and our families. Um, I have a little chart here I wanna show you that is the model that we are currently using that we have found works really well. For every family that fosters within our ministry, we surround them with a care community. Um, every family that fosters has their own primary respite family. And that family is focused just on them. And of course, you know, foster uh, primary respite families take care of all the overnight babysitting that, happen, that happens in the context of the foster um, community. So they take care of all the overnight babysitting. But our primary respite families, we've given some extra little responsibilities. We've asked our primary respite families to keep their finger kind of on the pulse of the health of the foster family. They're the ones who are overseeing the whole care community, and they are watching the birth, I mean, the, watching the foster family and encouraging the foster family to keep having date nights and keep, you know, tracking with your own birth children, your, your biological children, and doing the things that you did before foster care came into your world. Um, the primary respite family is also um, making sure that all the other babysitting needs are covered using a calendar system that we're using now. And so they're kind of just watching out for the foster family and making sure that foster family is being taken care of well. The other thing we ask our every primary respite family to do is at the beginning of a placement, we ask them to organize some sort of social activity for the whole care community to come together with all of their kids so that the foster children can get to know the other children and, and these environments become very familiar for the foster children. Um, foster children generally are, you know, are afraid when they come into a new situation because they don't know what they're going to be facing. And, um, ha and knowing these families and knowing their children kind of sets them at ease a little bit more. So that's what our primary respite family does. The support team members, of course, take care of all the daytime and evening babysitting needs. They may bring meals if it's a particularly stressful week for the foster family. They um, do a lot of you know, carpooling or really anything that the foster family needs. So that's the way that we have set up our, our, our model. And in, in the process of doing this and having done this for a few years, we realized that um, there were two added benefits that came that are universal foster care issues that we've discovered. And one is um, the whole idea of children being disrupted, their placement being disrupted. This model for us, we have found that the number of, of disruptions has gone dramatically down, and also our foster family retention has gone way up. And as you can imagine, if a foster family has this type of support, they're going to have a lot more emotional and mental and physical margin for the difficulties that may be unexpected in a foster care placement. So that brings those, reduction, those um, disruptions down. It also um, really does sustain them and allow them to come to the end of their end of that placement and feel like they can do it again, maybe after a short break or something like that. But none of us really want foster care to all be about a model or systems or any of that. Foster care is really about relationships. And especially for us as Christians, we know that we have something to offer these children that, that nobody else can offer. We can show them a heavenly father who loves them and who will never under any circumstances leave them. Um, when Andy and I first started in our personal journey of foster care, we were primary respite for three little girls who were biological sisters. 
and um, not these three. These are our current, this is a current family that we're involved with, but this was our first one. It was three little girls, and they had a great foster family that they were living with in, um, from our church, and we were a primary respite, so we had an opportunity to build relationships with the girls and spend a lot of time with them. And as time went on, it looked in this placement like one of the daughters was going to cause a disruption. And that did happen. And so we were already in place and had relationships with these girls. So the girls came to live with us. And during the same time, the roles flipped and the, the original foster family became a primary respite family while they got the training and the added um, training that they needed to take care of some special needs of this particular daughter. So while they were doing that, the girls were living with us. The rest of the community um, and, and support team stayed the same and stayed involved with the girls. So even though it was a disruption, it was a disruption that was maybe a little less traumatic for the girls. About five months went by and we transitioned the girls back to the original foster family. And um, fast forward a little bit more, it looked like the birth family was not going to um, make, we're not making the progress that they needed to make and the parents' rights were going to be terminated. And um, so that did happen. And, and the, the foster family that had the girls wanted to adopt them. So everything was on track for that. And um, the same particular daughter um, looked like she was going to need to get some other help and, and possibly cause a disruption again. Um, the courts decided to leave the other two where they were and let them progress on that um, track to adoption, and they moved the one daughter to a place where she could get some specialized help, help and care. While she was in this particular place, the, the whole community of care team stayed in place for her and continued to be involved with her. She was about an hour away from all of us, so we all took turns on weekends driving and picking her up and making sure she could be in the church and see her sisters and not have to um, sever the ties with her small group that she was very involved with. Um, so we made sure that was happening. During this time, her small group leader at church in her middle school um, department decided that she wanted to become one of the support team members so she could be more involved with this particular girl and spend time with her and help us with some of the driving. So she became a support team member in the process. Fast forward a little more and it looks like this particular girl is not gonna be reunited with her sisters. But the, the, the small group leader and her husband and family stepped up to, um, to adopt her. So as I talk to you now, this is in process, and we're hoping that that's going to all work out, and it looks like it will. On July 4th, she gave me a call, and she said, Sandra, um, I am going to, since our, she's, gonna, she's now in high school, she just hit ninth grade, so she said, now that I'm um, back, I want to be a small group leader for, El for our Upstreet program, which is our elementary age kids. And she said, I wondered if you would write a recommendation for me. And of course, after I swallowed, you know, big and, and tried not to cry while I was talking to her, I said, of course I will do that. And I share that story with you because I love the way that this community of support surrounded her and it made, even though there was a disruption, it made it far less traumatic for her, far less traumatic for her sisters. And now she has been so well cared for, she wants to turn around and start caring for some younger girls. And um, so I just wanted to share that. I, I love the way this is working for our families. And so I was asked to just present it to you and I hope that this will be helpful. Thank you.